We are happy to welcome you to one more session of the Math Associate Seminars from the ITPP. Our speaker today is Ariel Pachutti from the Universidad Nacional de Córdoba. And he's speaking about modularity of some geometric objects, definition, reasons, and the state of the art. Please go ahead. Okay, so first of all, I want to thank Alejandra for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I was told that this was supposed to be a talk mostly aimed for PhD students and postdocs, so I'm going to try to I'm going to try to give some ideas and examples and not so many proofs. Actually, I don't think I have any proof in my talk, so I apologize for that. So let, let me start with some simple example. So let's consider the projective line. So I'm going to denote it by P1. And I'm going to take P and E prime and any positive number and we know that if we want to count the number of points in P1 of Fp to the n, then such number is P to the n plus one. I think everyone is more or less happy with this fact. I mean, we know that points are always of the form, we can choose the points of the form A1 and the point zero one, uh, sorry, one zero. And then you have P to the n possibilities for the first case, and you have an extra one for the second one. And then the Hasselbein theta function. What you have want to want, what you want to do is when you have a geometric object, you want to count the number of points over the different extensions. All extensions starting from the finite field where your variety is defined, and then you want to put all this information in in some uh, analytic function. Uh, well, this is just uh, at first it's just a formal power series, and and then you want to see if you can extract information from there. And in, in this particular case, I mean, use, using this, this formula over here, we know that we can split the sum. We're going to have a, a term with the shape P times T to the N over N plus one term, which is just T to the N over N. And then if we use the formula for, for the logarithm, I, I'm, I'm just talking about formal power series then we can see that when you compute this theta function, then it has only two terms. One term, one minus t, which comes from this contribution, and one term, one minus uh, p times t, coming from this contribution over here. And this is something that is related to base conjecture. I'm going to say a few words later. But this works for a particular prime. So this is like the first part of the story. And now what we would like to do is to consider all different primes at the same time. So this is the second baby example. So what we do is we gather the information from all the local contributions together. And now we, we don't want this just to be anything, something formal, but we want this to, to be an actual function. So we, we have to evaluate and try to put some constraints so that this gives a, a, a complex function. And so what we do is we consider the local pieces we defined before, and we evaluate the variable t in p to the minus s. And this is for, for conventions. And then we, we take the product of all primes, and I, I'm cheating here a little bit when, when I'm going to talk about the general picture. We have to be a little more careful. I mean, what happens here is that the uh, projective line has good reduction at all primes, so this is why we can just do this without any extra hypothesis. And then remember that we had one minus t and one minus p times t. So when we replace t by p to the minus s, we, we get one minus p to the minus s times one over one minus p to the one minus s. And this is something that is well known. The first product corresponds to the theta function at s, and the second product corresponds to the theta function at s minus one. And now if you study the properties of the theta function, you know that this is a function which converges in some half uh, complex plane. So with a half complex plane, I mean all points whose real part is bigger than something. And in which half plane it converges, it depends on which of the two parts you are looking at. So for example, the first one converges for real part of S uh, greater than one. But what is really interesting of this theta function, which is something that Riemann proved, is that it can be extended to the whole complex plane and it, it satisfies some uh, functional equation. And actually it has a pole at S equals 
uh, one. That's why you can the, the series doesn't converge to, to the left of s equals to one. And it has residue one. And the other part has a pole in, in shifted. <clears throat> and we're going to talk a little bit about these shifts and how they appear in different situations. <clears throat> but so what is important here is that you can extend it and you have a functional equation. This is the two important properties of this easy example. <clears throat> okay. What happens if we want to go to a more general situation? So <clears throat> as I said, <clears throat> I started with the projective uh, line, not the affine line. So we're going to look at smooth projective varieties. So these are given by equations in some projective space uh, of dimension D and I'm going to work over any finite field and we can do something similar to what we did before. We start counting the number of points over FQ. Now Q can be a power of P. It depends where you're working and then you look at all its extensions. So it's given by powers of uh, Q. Then you count the number of points and you put this into this uh, power series and, and you, you look at the exponential and then you ask what properties does this theta function satisfy? Remember that in the previous case it, it has it had a really simple expression. It was just a quotient of polynomials, right? It, it was given by 1 over 1 minus t and 1 minus p times t. So you might wonder what happens in general and so this is part this is part of waste based conjecture. So it has more or less three different parts. The, fir the first part of, of the conjecture is that it's given by a rational function. So by a rational function, it means that it's a quotient of polynomials. Um, this part was proved by Dwork around 1960. And note that it, it has some indices, the polynomials, P0, P2D, to d P1, P2D to d minus one. So the even ones goes in the denominator and the odd ones goes in the numerator. And each one of these polynomials have some particular properties. They are integral polynomials, so they have integer coefficients. coefficients. And the theta function satisfies a functional equation, something similar to what it, it happened before. Um, and what's most important is that in each one of these polynomials, the, the roots have absolute value. Uh, Q to the I over two. And here, let me explain just a little bit what I, I mean with this part over here. So this is something that is relating to different objects. So suppose you start with some variety that it has, it, it's defined over some uh, number field, for example, over the rationals or something like this. Then you can look at its reduction and then you're, you're working over a finite field, over FQ. But also you can look at it, for example, as a complex variety, and you can just compute some other cohomologies, for example, like the Betti cohomology. And what it's telling you here is that if you compute the Betti cohomology of your global object, then this, its dimension coincides with the degree of your polynomial. So recall that we started with P1, right? So it's the projective plane. So P1 has dimension one, and we can compute the Betti cohomology. H0 is one, H1 is zero and H2 is one, right? So what it's going to, to say, this conjecture is that when you want to compute the theta function, it has to be a quotient, well, D is equal to one, so you have P0, P1, and P2. Since H1 is zero, it means that P1 has degree zero, so there is nothing in the numerator, which is exactly what happened in, in a previous situation. Since the H0 is one, it means that you, it, you need to have a degree one polynomial. And if we look at the third condition here, it says that the root has to have absolute value Q to the zero. So it has to be the polynomial one minus T. And the last fact over here means that the P2 is also degree one and its roots needs to have absolute value Q to the one, to the first power. So then it's given by one uh, minus P times T or q times t, right? So the, the root is one over q, which has absolute value q. And so what's this um, base conjecture says is that <clears throat> you, 
you can read all the information and, and it has these prescribed properties. Of course, knowing just the absolute value of the roots of a polynomial doesn't give you the polynomial in general. So the, the projective line is a very particular easy example. But also, for example, you can com construct this theta function just by counting points. And in particular, you can recover the uh, Betty numbers from this formula. So it, it's a, it, it combines a, a combinatorial part with a geometric part. So this is really interesting. OK, and then we can do something. OK, so let me, let me uh, show you an example, and not so easy example. And as I said, most of the talk will be about examples. So let's start with an elliptic curve. An elliptic curve is just an equation of this form. It's y squared equals a cubic polynomial. And I'm going to assume the characteristic of our base field is not two or three, so I can write it in an easy uh, way. It really doesn't matter. Now, if we go back to base conjecture, then we can compute the Betty numbers of our elliptic curve. The h0 is equal to the h2, which is 1. But the h1 is 2. So what this means is that if I want to compute the theta function, then I'm going to have, well, two parts in the denominator, one corresponding to the h0 and one corresponding to the h2, which are already given by this information and information on the absolute value of the roots. And then in the numerator, I'm going to have a degree 2 polynomial. Okay. And I know that the roots have absolute value q to the one half. So the product has have absolute value q. And in particular, for the theta function to, to, to be given by this uh, particular quotient of polynomials, it implies that if I want to compute the number of points, then it has to be given by this particular formula, where alpha and beta are the roots of the, the polynomial appearing in the numerator. So this somehow. You, you, you get this for free from base conjectures. But you don't know which are the numbers alpha and beta. And beta, sorry. And, and so what, what you can do, know that, okay, know that if you call a q of e, then the, the sum of the two roots. Now, if you compute the number of points, you look at this formula here, and it tells you that the number of points is going to be one plus Q minus the, the AQ of E, the, the sum of the two roots. And in particular, if you just count the number of roots, the number of points of your elliptic curve mod Q, then you know the number of roots over any extension of FQ. So you can recover, it's, you, 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 it's not that you can only recover your theta function, but you can only also give a formula for the number of points over any finite extension of FQ. Okay, and of course you can, uh, the, the way to prove it is going the, all the way around, right? You start counting points and you prove that the formula holds, but somehow I'm doing like reverse engineering. So once I know what the expected result should be, I can show you why, why, how, how you get this information. And, and, and I, w I want to stress something important here is that for computing the whole theta function, you only need to count the number of points of your elliptic curve over FQ, okay? In general, if your polynomial has degree, has higher degree, then this will not be enough, right? Because in this case, we want to compute two numbers, alpha and beta. And the point is that we know that the product has to be Q and we're computing its sum. So since I only have two numbers, if I know the sum and the product, I can uh, know the two of them precisely. But if I have, I don't know, 10 different roots, then I need to start counting over many extensions and then these computations becomes extremely challenging from a computational point of view. Okay, are there, I don't know if there are questions, if I'm supposed to ask for questions or I should go ahead, Alejandra? Go ahead. Uh, okay. Okay, if there is any question, just post it and Alejandra will let me know. Yes, anything. Okay. So, what do we do now? So, we, we just keep, do the same thing. We, we define the global Hasse Bale a theta function. And, and what we do now is we just take the product of all the local contributions and we do exactly the same thing as we did for the projective plane. We substitute our variables at variable t in p to the minus s. And here we have to be a little careful, 
with the primes where our smooth uh, projective variety has bad reduction. Okay, so this is something that I, I'm not going to talk about it, but you have to think that if you, if you start with a variety, then there are many different instances that may occur. For example, it might be that you start with an equation which gives you something which is uh, singular when you reduce mod p, but it is something, but, but the issue is that the equation is not good enough, enough. You may take a change of variables and get a better equation where now your uh, curve or your variety has good reduction. So this is something that might occur. Uh, and so you have to be uh, really careful with this. But at least for all the primes of good reduction, where, where, where you take your equations and you reduce mod p and you get the non-singular uh, variety, then you do precisely the same thing, okay? And now what happens is that now the theta function, it converges for some half plane, okay? So the, the, the situation is pretty much the same as it happened with the Riemann theta function. And it's, it comes from um, the, the, the fact that we know best conjecture. So, and so, so we know on, on these parts here that they appear different polynomials and we know the absolute value of its roots. And this will give, you, give us enough information to be sure that this converges in some half plane. And so the conjecture is that what happens with this theta function, and we expect all of them to extend to a meromorphic function on the complex numbers, and we also expand, expect it to satisfy some functional equation. Okay, so remember that here we have to be a little careful. I, I'm being a little vague here. For example, when we computed the theta function of P1, remember that it was given by us the theta function of S times the theta function of S minus one. Okay, so when we're saying a, a functional equation, so, I mean, I cannot put a functional equation for the two pieces together, right? I mean, each one satisfies a different functional equation, but still, they do satisfy functional equations and, and the functional equation should be something that has to do with the different um, the homology degrees that appear. So I, I will come back to this uh, later. Okay, so let's go back to elliptic curves. If I start with my elliptic curve, then I can compute the theta function. And remember that when I computed the theta function of the elliptic curve in terms of T, then it had a part which was like one minus t and one minus p times t. And in the numerator, I had a degree two polynomial. Okay. Do you want to ask something, Alejandra? No, okay. So in the numerator, I had a degree two polynomial. So this, these two parts here will give me again the theta function at s and the theta function at s minus one. And the part coming from the degree two polynomial, it's what I'm going to call the L series of the, my elliptic curve. So by definition, it is given by the product over all primes, just the good ones, of one divided by one minus AP of E times P to the minus S. Remember that I had a T here, and then P to the one minus two S because I have P times T squared, okay? And this converges for the real part of S greater than three halves. And these three halves here comes from the estimate that the absolute value of AP of E is less than a two square root of P. So this is Hass's bound. And now the, the natural equation is that, so I, I know that the, the two terms in the numerator, which comes from, from the theta function, I know that they do extend to the whole complex numbers and they satisfy a functional equations and this is due to Riemann. And what happens with the denominator? Can I say or prove that this L series extends to the host complex numbers? And furthermore, I mean, is it holomorphic or it has poles? Because for theta function, we, we expect poles to appear. But what happens with this L series? So the story goes some, somehow this way. If I start with a curve which has complex multiplication, so complex multiplication means that uh, the, the endomorphism rings so all the maps from the elliptic curve to itself is bigger than just multiplying by integers. Then what happens is that the L series in this case is related somehow to something similar to the theta function, which is you, you have to add a character, a Hecke character, and it, it factors as, as the product of the L series of two Hecke characters, one Hecke character and its conjugate. And what happens in this case is that you get the extension from 
the extension of the L series of the Heke character. So I, I think this is due to Heke mostly, but I, I don't know the, the precise reference. Um, so using similar a, a similar proof than, than that given by Riemann, you can prove that if your curve has complex multiplication, then the L series satisfies expected properties, but it is holomorphic. Okay, this is something that happens with any character. If you start also with a Dirichlet character, then the L series extends holomorphically. It doesn't have a pole. The pole comes from the theta function, not from the L series given by Dirichlet characters. Okay, and this this will happen for for higher dimensional things, but if the curve doesn't have complex multiplications, so these ideas of, of Riemann are, are not enough. We really do not know how to extend this L series or to prove anything uh, out of them. So I, I want to change subjects a little bit completely, and I want to mention what we know how to do. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm sure most of you already read something on this, but let me just recall what is a modular form. The, I, I'm being vague all around the talk, so uh, forgive me for that. So I'm going to take k to be a positive integer, and a weight k modular form is just a form from the upper half plane, okay, so the complex numbers with positive uh, imaginary part to the complex numbers, which satisfies some functional equation, which is given by, if you take a matrix a, B, C, D in SL12C. We call that SL12C are two by two matrices with integral coefficients and determinant one. Then this, this group acts by uh, homotities, I think it's called. So sending C to AC plus B over C, C plus D. And what, what you want to do is when you evaluate the function F at an image of an homotity, you want it to be related to the function to the value of f at c, okay? And it changes by c, c plus d to the k. So the, the story of, the, of these functions comes from trying to understand holomorphic differentials on quotient of the upper half plane. And for, I, I, I just wrote it for SL2 of c, but we will also be interested in subgroups of these like gamma naught of n or gamma one of n, where gamma naught of n, you ask, you impose the extra conditions that the, uh, by the, the place two one is divisible by n. So see, it's it's a little smaller subgroup, so it doesn't matter. And also, you you have to impose some holomorphic condition at cusps. Okay, so I, I will say just one word about this. So if you look with this definition, if you look at the matrix one one zero one, it acts sending c to c plus one, and the, this part here is trivial. So it means that your, your function is invariant under translation, and in particular, it has a Fourier expansion, <laughs> which is given by some sum of powers of e to the two pi i n. If you take another subgroup like gamma one of n, you have to be a little careful, and then something might appear in the denominator, but it's not important. And the condition of being holomorphic implies that I want this sum to start from zero. <clears throat> this is the definition. Okay, and for most of the things I'm going to say, I, I will all, only consider forms which are called cast forms, in which case you also impose the condition that the A0 is equals to zero. Okay, um, this has to do with the holomorphic differential being holomorphic at the cusp, but it, I, I, I don't want to get too technical. And then <clears throat> to, to a modular form, you can attach what is called a Melin transform, it's given by a transform, but it's not important how it's defined. It's an integral and you have to, to take a convolution with, with some exponential function. But the, the, the result is what's called the L series of the, the M function, which is given by the same sum. Note that the coefficients are the same ones as I had before. I start from one because I only consider cuspidal ones, but then you have N to the S in the denominator instead of an, an exponential. And <clears throat> again, you can prove that if you your form is a modular form of weight k, then this sums converges from some half plane, okay? Real part of s bigger than one plus k over two. <clears throat> okay, I, I don't want to, to give all the definitions, but there's something important that you, you have an involution in this space. It's roughly speaking given by 
the matrix zero minus one and zero, if, if you look at the level gamma zero of n, and it, since it's an involution, so it squares the identity, then you can split the space between the forms which has eigenvalue one and eigenvalue minus one, or, or you have to add something if you look gamma one, and, and then looking at, if you start with a form which is an eigenform for this involution, then you can prove that its L series extends to a holomorphic function on the whole complex plane. Okay, and of course, since if you want only extension, then you don't need to be an involution because any form can be written as sum of eigenforms. So if you can extend the eigenforms, you can extend all of them. But the important part here is that it also satisfies a functional equation, which is what we are expecting coming from the Riemann theta function. Okay, so extension holds for all of them, but if you want some functional equation, you need to, to, to stick to, to some particular ones. Okay, so, so this is something which is somehow related to Riemann's theta function because you, you have something which is like a, a Dirichlet sum, and, and then you, you know that you have functional equation and you, you have that extension, it can be extended. Okay. And so what, what is the goal? The goal is to try to relate these analytic functions with geometry. So in particular, if I can prove that if I start with, I don't know, something with like an elliptic curve and the L series matches the L series of one of these forms over here, then I, I, I get extension and functional equation for free. So somehow the analytic side propagates its nice properties to the geometric side. And this is somehow the, the goal. So let me go back to elliptic curves. Um, so I, I, did, I didn't write it here. K is going to be equals to two. So suppose we start with an eigenform for the Hecke operators. It doesn't matter too much what it is. I, I will say a few words. And let's suppose that it has rational Fourier expansions. Okay, so remember that when we started with an, a, a modular form, you can write it as a Fourier expansion. A n times e to the two pi i n. So I'm asking for these numbers here to be rational. So you can always normalize your form so that all these coefficients lie in a finite extension in, in a number field, the finite extensions of q, and I'm asking them for precisely be rational. And in this situation, then there is a construction due to Eichler and Shimura. So it, it comes from an old construction of uh, Abel and, and Jacobi that to a modular form, you can attach an elliptic curve, okay? And, and, and this is pretty explicit. It comes from how the, the, the complex points of an elliptic curve are, are a torus, so they, they have genus one. And so what you do is you just compute this by integrating <clears throat> um, some, some periods against the uh, differential form, the holomorphic differential coming from your modular attached to your uh, modular form. And, and, and when you compute this integral, it gives you a period lattice, and then the, the elliptic curve is just the quotient of the complex numbers by this period, period lattice. And, and, and the important property that Eichler and Shimura proved is that the L series matched, okay? So they proved that it, you have to be very careful with the price of path reduction, but, but that's still okay. And <clears throat> What what is these Hecke operators have to do? So 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 how what happens is that you have these um, nice modular curves which are the, the quotients x zero of n, which are just the quotients of the upper half plane by gamma naught of n. Uh, and, and this is a curve. So so you can look at this Jacobian, and and when you look at the Jacobian, it's a variety of really high dimension. But what happens is that this Jacobian has a lot of endomorphisms appearing on them. And so here you have something acting, which is what is called the Hecke operators. And, and so since you have all these endomorphisms in, in your variety, then you, you can try to split it into different pieces according to these uh, endomorphisms. And, and what happens is that this part here is isogenous to products of different abelian varieties, which are somehow most less irreducible and, and, and your elliptic curve appears somehow in this way. So this is where the, the Hecke operators appear but as I said I, I don't want to get too technical. 
So the important here is that you have a rule that if you start with an eigenform with rational Fourier coefficients, you can attach to it a an elliptic curve. And then the Shimura Taniyama conjecture or, or questions, but it was a conjecture, is whether all curves or rational curves appear in this way. So is it true that you can construct any elliptic curve from modular forms? Okay. And so this has a lot of advantages. Of course, one of them is that we can translate since DL series match, and we know that the left-hand side can be extended and has analytic continuations, we get the same for the right-hand side for free. But also it has other implications that maybe it, it, they're not so trivial. What happens, for example, if we want to make tables of elliptic curves? So if you want to make tables, you, you want to order them in, in some reasonable way. Uh, there's something called a conductor. And then you want to be sure whether your tables are complete or not. Uh, and somehow the, the point is that computing modular forms is easy. It, you just have to, to do some computation. I mean, you have to uh, triangulate some, some variety, some curve. And, and so in particular, if this is true, you can always also prove that you have complete tables of elliptic curves, which is what happens, for example, in the LMFDB uh, or looking at all uh, Cremona's tables. And, and, and the answer to this question is yes, and, and this is pretty much the, the, the theorem of Weiss and Taylor Weiss. And it, the, what they proved is that uh, this is true for um, semi stable elliptic curves, but this was later generalized to all elliptic cases by uh, Brill, Conrad, Diamond, and, and Taylor. And in particular, <coughs> the, the Hasselberg conjecture is true. Okay, the series of an elliptic curve does extend. And, and, and it satisfies a functional equation. So what happens if we want to generalize this strategy? So we started with <coughs> objects, with geometric objects, with we only consider genus zero, like P1, genus one, like elliptic curves, and we didn't do anything else. So if we want to generalize these results, we can go in two different directions. So somehow the point here is we have an analytic part and we have a geometric part. And the question is when we want to generalize, so, some, in one side some computations are easier than on the other one. For example, we can, instead of working over Q, we can say what happens if I take an extension of Q. So on the geometric side, then it's clear what we have to do because we, we start with a, a, a scheme or, or a variety of a K and we just count points. So it, it, it's clear what we're doing. But what happens here? What should we put instead of modular forms? Okay, so if we want to change the base field, the, the analytic side, is, it's a little harder to describe. So it's convenient to, to, to talk about the modular forms in, in the automorphic language. And, and what, what you have to do is you have to look at representations of some, um, of some groups, of some reductive groups. And, and in the case of elliptic curves, it they corresponds to um, automorphic forms on, on GL2 of the, the Adele groups of Q. And then it, once you, you, you understand this, which, which I think it was a huge step in, in history, um, and you, you, once you understand what you, you are trying to do, then if you want to increase your base field, then what you have to do is you look at automorphic forms or, or automorphic representations, and you just change the Q by K. Okay, but it's not completely clear from the picture of modular forms. But I mean, it, it, it comes from, you, you can look at the upper half plane as a quotient of a GL2 of R, and, and then this, this is more or less where the, all this, big, this GL2 group appears. And so what do we know, what do we know in this, in this uh, particular situation? Well, <clears throat> the, 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 there are, some interesting results during the last couple of years. If we have a, a, a field K, which is totally real, so totally real means that in general, you, you can look at a, you, a, any field, you can write it as adding some element to, to Q, number fields. And, and then what you're asking, this is going to be root of a polynomial, and you ask all the roots of this polynomial to be real. This is what a totally real field means. And if, it's, if it is quadratic or of degree three, then we do no modularity of elliptic curves, okay? So for real quadratic fields, this is a, a theorem of uh, Freitas, Lejung, and Sixek. 
And for cubic fields, it is a result of Derek, Nachman, and Sixek. And this is from 2018, I think, or something like this. So Hasse conjecture are true. But if we take a totally real field or a CM extension, a CM extension is an, a, a totally imaginary extension of a totally real field, then what we do know is that any elliptic curve over K is what's called potentially modular. So the, the notion of potentially modular, this is something that came, I, I think this was an idea of Taylor. And it, it means, I don't want to, to give the precise definition, but it means that it is attached to a modular form, not over K, but over some ex field extension. And this has to do with how you prove modularity. You don't get risk of modularity otherwise. But there is a, a really nice result, and all results of, of Prague, that um, implies that if you prove that something is potentially modular, then you can prove extension of the hasse uh, bale uh, theta function. But the part that you do not get, you do not get holomorphicity. You only get that you can extend it in a meromorphic way. You do get functional equation, but you might have poles. Okay, so the idea is that you write your Hasse-Bailey function as a quotient of different Hasse-Bailey functions. Each one of them are holomorphic, but the ones in the denominator might have zeros. So we do expect things to be holomorphic, but in this case, we, we only get a meromorphic continuation. Okay, and, and this is, uh, so the, the CM case, it's, it's a really hard one. It's also from the uh, 2018 and it has many authors. So I'm going to, to mention all of them. Okay, and if you want to look at imaginary quadratic fields, then you can somehow try to prove modularity for each given case. So this is something that Cremona has been doing, computing tables of uh, Bianchi modular forms. And what we did with uh, Luis Dulefe and Lucio Geberov was to prove that most of them, or many of them are modular, giving an algorithm to, to check modularity. And then you can replace meromorphic by holomorphic. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about what happens if we want to increase the genus. So if we start with a genus two curve and we try to compute the theta function, then the formula is going to be similar. We're going to get two theta functions in the numerator, but the denominator is harder. Now it's going to be a degree four polynomial. So it's even challenging to try to compute it. Okay, it's not so easy and it takes more time. Um, so the, 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 the way to think about it is that when you start with the curve and you look at its Jacobian, it's, an, it's a, a surface of dimension, the genus. So it's going to be an abelian surface. And the modularity of the Jacobian was conjectured by Yoshida and Brummer and Kramer somehow gave a refined conjecture where they, the, the main contribution was to give a specific description of the level of the uh, modular form you're searching for. In this case, what you're searching for Siegel modular forms. So you, you can think of this as automorphic representations of GSP4 or you can think of it as functions in some generalized upper half plane. I don't want to get too much into details because I, I want to say a few more things. And, and so, so what they, 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 they gave a recipe for the precise level where this should appear and they also um, made many comp computations on um, surfaces and giving a list of the ones that appear for the first uh, values in, in the semi-stable case. And, and and then if, if and so, so more or less the idea is the, the, the idea is the, the same as, as the, I mentioned before, you have an analytic object where you know that it's the, the series can be extended and it's a functional equation and you have a geometric object and somehow you want to match these two ones. And the way everything starts is that if you know where to search, you can just start playing with examples. So you compute some abelian surfaces and then you go and try to search for the uh, automorphic forms and see whether they match or not. So there, there is a big issue here, which is that um, all, all these forms are going to be of weight two and uh, automorphic forms for just before of weight two are um, non-comological. So this is like trying to compute weight one forms for the ones who, who know this. Uh, and, and the problem is that they are extremely hard to compute. I mean, it, you, you can just, don't know, tessellate some variety or something and try to compute in this way. You need 
extra tricks and, and it's really time consuming. So computing, I don't know, the first I don't know, 100 Fourier coefficients might take a couple of weeks. And <coughs> what we do know nowadays is that all abelian surfaces are potentially modular. This is a result of a boxer, a Calegari, Guy, and Piloni from I think 2018 also, at the end of 18. And what, what we did with, in, in this joint article with uh, Bruma, uh, myself, Puer, Tornaria, Boyd, and Yuen, is to give a recipe to adapt uh, an algorithm, which is this, uh, this is faulting search method, to prove modularity of abelian surfaces. So if you give me an abelian surface with some not so restricted hypothesis, you need the image of the residual representation at two to be not too small. And you give me a candidate for the automorphic form to prove that the two a series actually do match. Okay. And for curves of genus greater than three, then not much is known. Okay, so this is really a, a, a huge jump and there are some reasons. There is a, a post by Frank Allegari explaining why our, our nowadays techniques are not enough to, to do this. Um, unless the Jacobian has many endomorphisms. Remember that if we, when we start with an elliptic with complex multiplication, then it comes from some Hecke character. So in this case, you get modularity, but because it's not something genuine, so somehow it's something weird. Okay. And the extra five minutes I have or so, I want to talk about some other examples that appear, and I think it's interesting and maybe interesting for the audience um, particularly. So I, I, as I said, I don't want to be too technical in anything, so I'm not going to give uh, the precise definition, but I'm going to say what a Galeabidiao variety satisfies. So a Galeabidiao variety of dimension D, it, what it satisfies is that when you want to compute the, 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 the dimension of the cohomology groups, then you have a Hodge decomposition and what it satisfies is that, so if, if when you do this, the, the Hodge diagram, then all the elements in, in the orders of your diamond, the, the dimensions are zero, okay? And, and the, the middle one is going to be one. So I'm going to talk about examples mostly. So for example, if you start with a one dimensional Calabria variety, then it's going to be something like this. I mean, this, this condition here imposes no condition at all, D is equal to one, so there is no integer between zero and one, so it doesn't impose any condition. And this condition here imposes that the H one zero has to be one, so the Hodge diagram is precisely that of an elliptic curve, so these are precisely the, the elliptic curves. Well, if you have a two-dimensional Calabria variety and you look at the Hodge diagram, then you have to put here zeros, this is the, the first condition, and the second condition is that you have to put here ones, and well, the, the 20 comes from some criteria, doesn't matter. And no, no that, so I, I, I'm not, I, I would like to, to compute the theta function of, of this uh, Calabria variety and see whether it, it extends or it doesn't extend. And so I, I'm, I'm playing here with something which is related to the proof of the base conjecture, which is there is a relation between counting points and computing cohomology. So we already mentioned the Betty cohomology. Now this has to do with uh, the tal commodity where representations appear. And so your theta function is going to, these two parts here are, go, are going to give you the two terms theta of s and theta of one minus s in, in our previous example. And then this part here is somehow like the new interesting and hard part to compute and where we don't know wh whether the, the Hasse-Bele function extends or not. And, and what happens is that the, the neuron severity group, so this comes from cycles inside your variety, modulo equivalence. This gives you a contribution to this H2. So this part here is the H2. This is H0, H1, H2, H3, and H4. And, and you have um, a, the duality. So, so that's why it's symmetric. And, and, and these contributions, you, you know that all these parts there contribute something which is like a, a theta function. It might not be divine over Q, but it, it, it is like some extra theta function factors. This is called the algebraic part. And then you have something new, which is called the transcendental part, okay? So if you never saw this neuron severity group, it really doesn't matter. But if this neuron severity group has maximum rank, the maximum number it can get is 20, then 
know that the remaining part, which is something that we do, do not understand, it is two dimensional, right? I mean, the total number is 22. One plus 20 plus one is 22. I have 20, then I have two remaining. And then it, it, when I look at this color representation, then I'm going to have a 20 dimensional part coming from the neuron severity group, which I know it, it extends and satisfies some functional equation. And then I have this extra two dimensional part, which is like the weird one. And if I can prove that <coughs> it extends to the whole complex plane and satisfies the functional equations, I get the whole has several conjecture for free. And, and in this case, so this is something proved by Livne, this two dimensional part is actually a modular. It comes from a modular form of weight three and some event typos. But nowadays we have something even better. We have a, something which is called such conjecture, which says somehow that any two dimensional uh, representation over the rationals, which some minor hypothesis, um, comes from a modular form. You need it to be um, even the determinant, uh, the, the, the determinant at, at complex conjugation has to be minus one. You need it to be odd, sorry. And <clears throat> you see, so for this particular, so it, it, these ones which are called extremal, um, Calabiyao two dimensional, when the rank is, is as, as big as it can be, you also get modularity, okay? So again, you, you have something which comes from an algebraic part, which is some sort of a theta function, and then you have a remaining part which comes from a modular form. So you see, this is really interesting because the whole picture here, this is what, what I was saying before, when you want to count uh, the number of points, you have some parts coming from theta functions, and then you the middle ones, I mean, it depends on the dimension, then it might be harder to, to understand, but sometimes this, like the Galois representation, splits as different parts, and some parts are easier to, to understand. Okay. And also, <clears throat> there, are <clears throat> there are some results of um, Livne, uh, Matthias Schutt, and Yui, which prove that in, for some other smaller ranks, the, modular, the modular, uh, modularity is also known. <clears throat> and what happens is that, I mean, if you have, as I said before, if you have a four dimensional representation, it's not clear whether it should be modular or not, but, if you have something which has many endomorphisms, then it should come some, somehow from a Hecke character. So what they prove is in, that in many instances, these L series come from Hecke characters, so we know the, the whole picture. And <clears throat> let me talk, uh, and I, I'm almost done. Let me talk about uh, three falls. So before I was talking about Calabiao's surfaces, so dimension two, and I want to talk about dimension three. So a Calabiao three fold, it's called rigid, if the H21, so this number here, is zero. Okay, know that if this number is here by symmetry, this other number here is zero as well. So it tells you that the middle part, which is in general the hardest one, it's going to be two dimensional as well. This, this H11 somehow is algebraic, it comes from psycho, so it's, you do know that it has it, some analytic continuation and functional equation, but so what happens is that when you have a rigid Calabria threefold, then the H3 is going to be two again. And so again, we get that it is modular and it comes from a weight four modular four. And this, this result was mainly uh, proven by Dulefe and Mayo Harmayum. But again, now, uh, it, it follows from cell conjectures nowadays. So this result is, is older than, than cell conjectures, okay? And let, let me go back just one second. Know that when you had the surface, the weight was three. And now that we have a, something of dimension three, the weight is four. So this is one plus D in general, okay? And for some non-rigid Calabiao three folds, um, what happens is that sometimes, so, so non reaching means that these numbers are non-zero, and then this part here might be, the dimension of this might be quite large, but there, there are some instances or, or many examples in the literature where the uh, H3 representation is reducible. So somehow it decomposes at as smaller di dimensional parts, and then, so you might expect to prove modularity as well. So there are some really interesting examples of a uh, Berner, and Van Gieme examples on, on this sort of phenomena. And to, let, let me finish with another example, which is the Kontani-Scholten uh, Kintig. 
So you look at this, this polynomial, which is a, a HJHF polynomial in two variables. And then you look the 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 kinetic given by p of x1, x2 equals p of x3, x4. The, the equation is not so important. You have to desingularize. This has like, I think it has 121 singular points or 120, I don't remember exactly. So you have to desingularize this and, and then you compute the Hodge diagram and know that this is huge, okay? So, and this has to do with what I was saying before, this number 141 here is telling you that some polynomial with, which will have degree 141. So if you want to compute the theta function, it's extremely expensive because well, even if you know that the dimension of each different piece, you need to count the number of FP, FP squared over many different finite fields to be able to deduce precisely what are the polynomials. So this is also a, a computational challenge to try to compute the theta function of these guys over here. And, and the, the interesting part, the H3, so somehow this, this, this guy here is algebraic. So this guy here, this H3, this is four dimensional. So you have a four dimensional representation. And what Consanial Shulten realized is that when you look at this four dimensional representation and then you, you restrict this to Q square root of five, the Gala group of Q bar by Q square root of five, it splits as a direct sum of two two dimensional ones. So now you're, you're in a nice situation because it, it is something of dimension two, but over a quadratic extension. And, and what we prove that it actually comes from a modular form, but, but it is a Hilbert modular form. Um, and the weight is two, four, two and four, and, and the level is 30. So again, since it's related to some uh, object. So this is again, a case where you have a four dimensional representation, but it's not as big as it can be, because when you go to a quadratic extension, it splits as two two dimensional ones. And so we prove that it comes from a given modular form. And so again, you get that the zeta function satisfies the, the Hasebe conjecture. Okay, that's everything. Thank you. Thank you so much. So are there any questions? Uh, you can either unmute yourself or write it on the chat. And in the meanwhile, I'm going to also send a poll so that you could answer the poll what you think about your questions. So I ask if anyone. So um, I ask a question, but <laughs> so uh, for example, in the case of the K3 surfaces, uh, is the, can you say something about orthomorphisms when you have the modularity or when you expect the modularity, can you say something about orthomorphisms of the K3? Because it depends on the lattice, so I don't know if that's the thing that comes to my mind. So that would be my question. Um, you, you mean the K3 surface? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, when you say, so this part here, so it, um, I think, so I, I, I didn't look at the proof of, of these um, UE and shoot, these, these results where, where they, they get the CM forms. But, but what happens in many instances is that your, your, your surface, you look at the endomorphisms. I mean, you, you see, for example, in this equation here, you see it's pretty symmetric, right? So you know that you have a lot of endomorphisms already appearing there. And so, so sometimes what, what you try to do is you try to see whether you have enough endomorphisms to ensure that your variety should have, should come from something which, is, which has complex multiplication. So, so I mean, the, the way to prove this is that, um, so, so they, they give some conditions for, for the ranks of, of this um, neuron severity group. To, to, to be exceptional and so on. And each one of these cases, they somehow present families and they prove that any such calabi uh, variety belongs to one of the families and then they study the families on themselves. So it has to do, I think this is what you were asking, it has to do with equations. You have to know the equations to be able to say something. So I don't know if there is any theoretical information that from the neuron severity rank, you can deduce that it will have extra endomorphisms but I think what they do is they just compute the family and they do it on the family itself. Okay, thank you so much. 
Um, are there any other questions? So if not, we thank Ariel again. <laughs>